to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve as God and Father to Jesus, be power and glory forever and ever. Amen. What have God for our consideration today? Our words of the Old Testament lesson, Isaiah 51, or 52 rather, as I announced earlier. Um, here again, the first three verses as we get back into the message of the prophet. Wake up! Wake up! Put on your strength, Zion! Put on your beautiful garments, Jerusalem, the holy city. The uncircumcised and the unclean will no longer enter you. Stand up! Shake the dust off yourself! Take your seat, Jerusalem. Remove the bonds from your neck. Captive daughter Zion, for this is what the Lord says, you were sold for nothing and you will be redeemed without silver. This is God's word. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our lives aren't perfect, but sometimes the kinds of things we complain about are what people call first world problems. The, the, the things that are challenges to us don't have the same urgency or impact of some of the troubles faced by people who live in third world countries. So, for example, a first world problem might be something like your interconnect, internet connection is slow. It's irritating, but you'll probably get through it. Other examples of first world problems might be you've lost the remote to the television. The, the gallon of milk you brought home from the grocery store just today is already sour. Your uh, opening up this package that you received from Amazon and you find out, oh, they sent me the wrong size. Are these e things irritating? Do we like them? Well, yeah, it's, it's a bother. Are we going to manage to make it until tomorrow? Almost certainly. As Christians who live in the United States of America, sometimes the troubles, the persecutions, the attacks that we might face might be a kind of first world experience. So you, you know that in our country, nobody's burning Christians at the stake or feeding them to the lions. The, the police aren't breaking into our homes, dragging us out of them, throwing us into jail and torturing us. No, nobody is passing any laws that makes our faith illegal, at least not yet. We'll manage to get by. Perhaps the most uh, that we have to face might be times when we hear a politician or an intellectual or a celebrity mocking the Christian faith publicly. Uh, maybe you get into an argument with your neighbor or coworker about some biblical moral issue. Perhaps the yeah you have to live with this steady campaign uh, from the culture in which we live that is trying to get us and our children to let go of our faith and to go with the flow. And don't misunderstand me that that's that's something we should take seriously. It's constant and the stakes are eternal but uh, I don't have any fear that I am going to be facing a deadly attack like Christians face in places like Nigeria or Indonesia or many parts of the Middle East perhaps that circumstance in which we live makes it harder for us to relate to the the, the message, the prophecy, and the promise that the prophet Isaiah was trying to bring to the people of his day in his time as they dealt with the oppressors uh, with which they were familiar. He was addressing believers who were going to be facing 70 years of exile in a foreign country. These invaders were going to come and destroy their homes, destroy their businesses, destroy their entire way of life. And with all the destruction and havoc they were going to face, you could forgive these people perhaps if they began to worry about where this was going to go for them. 
what would happen to their faith with the promises, the saving promises that God had given through them? Were those things going to survive? So today, uh, on the one hand, we need to make sure that we don't fail to take very seriously the more subtle attacks that come into our lives because of spiritual stakes that are involved. At, at the same time, we should be careful not to miss the, the promise, the hope that Isaiah's message provides as we see the kind of God we have. Today, the prophet promises us a better future for the Lord's oppressed people, for God's oppressed people. As he gives us these these promises, this better future for God's oppressed people, we see that he's calling us to, to wake up to the Lord's protection and to rise to his deliverance and to know his presence. Anyone who cares doesn't like to lose. Losing has a way of taking away your enthusiasm. It can even sap your strength. I was talking to a friend recently who was complaining about her favorite team's losing ways, the losing streak in which they were on, and it was bothering her because it seemed to, to her that there just was no energy. The, the team was playing like they, they didn't really want to be out on the field. They, they weren't trying very hard. And it's not just the, the people who are involved in the contest that losing can affect. You know, the fan base gets affected also. First, it makes them mad. And, and, and then they start losing interest. They stop caring. They stop attending. The children of Israel were on a losing streak. When Isaiah was writing to them, uh, they, they had been kind of in the regular practice for some centuries now of getting beaten up by the enemy nations that they had around them, and uh, it wasn't going well for them. They were shrinking in their size. And then Isaiah hands them more bad news that uh, the Babylonian nation was going to come along, was going to invade their land, was going to carry them uh, all away. That was going to be kind of total defeat. It was all just too discouraging. But the losing streak was not going to last forever. Wake up! Wake up! Put on your strength, Zion! Put on your beautiful garments, Jerusalem, the holy city, for the uncircumcised and the unclean will no longer enter you. You know how depression doesn't just make you sad? It also makes a person tired, sometimes sleepy. Uh, th those who are depressed, sometimes they don't even want to get out of bed in the morning. And Isaiah was not going to stand to let God's people be, become that way. Wait, wake up, wake up, put on your strength, he says. Don't just lie there in bed and pull the sheets up over your head. You, you know how much uh, staying in bed too long can actually have kind of a, a counter uh, effect from what you might hope. Uh, that the longer you stay there, you get to the point where you're kind of slept out. You're not going to get any more sleep. But the longer you stay there, you, you, you get groggy. You're not sharp. Uh, you, you, you feel mm, lackluster. You have no energy. So Isaiah wanted God's people to wake up and uh, get up and uh, put their clothes on to get dressed and get on with their day. Put on your beautiful garments, Jerusalem, the holy city. Well, so, so, so what is this strength that the prophet has in mind that people can put on? What are these, these beautiful garments, these beautiful clothings in, in, in which he wants them to be dressed? The, the, the strength to which he refers is God's strength acting on their behalf in his saving work. The, the beautiful clothes well, that, 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 that is that, that holiness that God gives to his people as an act of his saving grace, as he cleanses them of their sins, as he 
uh, washes them up and makes them clean and makes them his own. Um, his holiness wraps them up this way and makes them beautiful. In Isaiah's day, these promises dealt with the Babylonians. That's the context in which Isaiah is providing this to the people. And the, the difficult times that they were going to face as a result, the discouragement that might come along because they became uh, an invaded and defeated nation. They were going to be subdued, subjugated, and led away. But they needed to understand that Jerusalem had lost, but only temporarily. For the uncircumcised and the unclean, that is, the, uh, the enemies, like these Babylonians, will no longer enter you. The Lord promised to provide his own protection. He'd make this city safe again, and he would make it their own. He would see to it that the children of Israel were able to, to fill, fill their place in the divine plans that he had had for them all along. They were going to carry out the, the holy purpose for which he had chosen them as his nation, that through this people, God would send the world Savior from sin and from death. And so he gives them, he promises them this divine protection. Our times are not the same as theirs. Our place in God's plans and purpose, it's different than what Israel served. And uh, our enemies, our battles don't look that much like the ones that they were facing some 2,700 years ago. But that doesn't mean we don't still struggle with our own. And sometimes, like them, you know, we're, we're just tired. We're tired of losing. We're, we're tired of those who would come to us and they would take advantage of our Christian kindness. They would impose on our time. They would invade our generosity and carry away our Christian charity. We're tired of what it seems to be is always the church of God losing. We, we, we see that more and more the, the people seem to be slipping uh, away from it. Well, I mean, in our attempts to bring the gospel to others, we, we see how there are so many competing voices that are occupying the the, the, the minds and attention of people and drawing uh, it away to maybe happier philosophies, to uh, less demanding expectations, to more self-gratifying ways of life. We're, we're, we're tired of the fact that we can't even get an audience with people. We don't even have an opportunity to speak the gospel because they're far too caught up in their recreational activities or making money or unfortunately listening to the unbelieving people who criticize the church constantly and want to make out Christians and Christianity as being nothing but backwards and stupid and harmful to human flourishing. We're tired. We're tired of our own battles with temptation, with the struggles that we have in the godly life that God demands of us. With, we're tired with trying. We're, we're tired of being the odd ones, of being the people who don't fit in. We're just tired. To all of which the Lord still says, wake up! Stand up! Put on your strength. Put on your beautiful clothes. You, you don't live in a city in uh, which he is going to provide you physical protection, but that doesn't mean that he does not still intend to protect his people spiritually. It's the way he works. 
You know, every Sunday at the end of the sermon, you hear me say the same phrase. It's a quote of the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 4. We hear it so often that perhaps we don't even think about what it really means as we prepare for the, the last run, the last part of the service. You know how it goes? And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? We'll keep your hearts and minds. It's not keep uh, in the sense of the opposite of get rid of or throw away. It's keep in the sense of watch and guard and protect. In the word of God, each Sunday, we have heard about his love and grace. We've heard the gospel, and what does that do? It sets up a wall around our souls. It is God's own way of protecting our minds from deception. It is God's own way of protecting our hearts from being crushed. In the forgiving grace of God, in the love of God, we still enjoy the protecting hand of God upon our lives. The uncircumcised and the unclean will no longer enter you, dear Christian. We wake up to his protection. And it's a better future. It is a better future for God's oppressed people. Similarly, Isaiah urges his people to rise to his deliverance. Stand up. Shake the dust off yourself. Take your seat, Jerusalem. Remove the bonds from your neck, captive daughter of Zion. For this is what the Lord says. You were sold for nothing, and you will be redeemed without silver. Well, now the prophet's picture has changed, hasn't it? Uh, from going to be the, the sleepy, tired person, laying in bed, not willing to get up, uh, we have gone to the fighter. The fighter who has been laid out. He has taken a right hook straight to the jaw, and it has knocked him to the ground, put him in the dust, nose down on the ground. You remember the, the second Rocky movie? in which Rocky Balboa and Apollo Creed just happened to land uh, punches on each other simultaneously right at the same time, and it knocks each one to the canvas. And then in slow motion, you see each man struggling to get up, and the man who gets up first is going to win. So we've taken the punch. Stand up, God tells his people. Shake the dust off. But he isn't telling them that they have to continue to fight. Uh, Take your seat, Jerusalem. Their fight is over. Now they can rest. And and, uh, remove the bonds from your neck, captive daughter of Zion. The captivity is over, at least in the vision that Isaiah is seeing, because Isaiah is able to see the end that God has in mind. He is able to see where this all leads. And where it all leads is to their freedom. Where it all leads is to their deliverance. God is going to come, and he is going to provide for them the deliverance from the oppressors that have attacked them. It wasn't going to cost them a thing. For this is what the Lord says, you were sold for nothing and you will be redeemed without silver. You know, for a little while, 70 years, historically, that's not that long, historically, these people had been under the Babylonians and the Babylonians thought that they owned them. They, they, They thought that they... They had Israel all wrapped up, the Jewish people. They could tell them what to do. They could tell them where to live. They could make them do whatever they wanted. But God had never given up his people. He had never sold them uh, away. It's not as though King Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonians had come along and offered God some kind of payment so they could have them for themselves. And so when the time comes to set them free, God doesn't feel like he's got to give anything back to that other side. That You'll be redeemed without silver, he says. You don't pay for what you already own. God was going to make sure that they were set free, redeemed. And the other side, well, in the end, they were going to be left with nothing. No exchange. This was a better future for the oppressed people of God. Again, our circumstances are not the same. Different world problems, if you want to talk about it that way. We... We face different challenges to our spiritual life. But the God we worship remains 
the same. He remains true. So this is the way he works. We can stand up. We can rise to his deliverance. It's what he does. You know, every day that we live our lives, it's not the Babylonians, it's the devil who uh, feels that he wants to take us captive. He wants to possess our souls. He, he, he gets in our heads and he wants to convince us that, you know, you belong to me. You have to do what I say. And you are trapped and there is no way out. You're going to face condemnation. You're going to face judgment. And there's nothing you can do about it. What a bunch of garbage. Do you know what price the devil paid for you? Nothing. He would not be willing to give up a single thing. It's not as though God has ever abdicated his position in your life. You've always, you do still belong to him. We are his. And so when he, he puts his claim on us, uh, you will be redeemed without silver. The devil gets nothing, which true, the Lord did redeem us with the blood of his one and only son, but that wasn't a payment made to the devil. That was a pay payment that he was making to his own justice. The devil gets nada. And, and even death itself was, so to speak, cheated because Jesus didn't stay dead, but he rose from the dead, leaving the grave empty. The enemies of God, the enemies of his people get nothing. You belong to the Lord who entirely, entirely intends to keep you and possess you. <clears throat> so, sometimes life is going to beat you down. You're going to get knocked to the ground. Don't just lay there as though you've been beaten. Stand up. Rise up, people of God. To find your deliverance. It's not in you, it's in him. Your God comes to your deliverance. It's a better future that he promises for the oppressed people of God. And after all the saving work, the Lord promises that we will also know his presence. For this is what the Lord says, at first my people went down to Egypt to reside there. Then Assyria oppressed them without cause. So, so, so now what have I here? This is the Lord's declaration that my people are taken away for nothing. Its rulers, well, that's the Babylonian rulers, by the way. This is the Lord's declaration. And my name is continually blasphemed all day long. Before making this last promise, God takes his people on a little trip down memory lane. The oppression of God's people was no news to the Jews. They had practically grown up this way. They were practically born out of oppression as the nation came out of Egypt. That's where they started. And then as time went along, we, we could talk about all the nations that came against them during the time of the judges and all the wars that David and Solomon fought. And, and most recently, Isaiah here talks about the Assyrians who'd come along and were threatening Israel's existence and were shrinking its borders, but they weren't going to succeed. Then, then uh, the, the Lord finally describes the Babylonians, that's who Isaiah is talking about without mentioning them by name, which was the next superpower, the next empire that was going to rise up and stand against them. Now, it's true the Lord might have been using, well, finally all of these, but the Babylonians here in particular as a way of teaching Judah and Jerusalem a lesson they desperately needed to learn. But that doesn't mean that God wasn't there doesn't mean that he had turned them over. Even in their oppression. And the Lord was certainly not fond of these faithless foreigners. Its rulers wail, and my name is continually blasphemed all day long. The Babylonians themselves were ripe for judgment. Their rule would come to an end. But for his own people, well, this is an opportunity to even get to know God better. Therefore, my people will know my name. Uh, therefore, they will all know on that day that I am he who says, here I am. In spite of all this passion, uh, oppression, past and present and future, God was there. He was there limiting it, measuring it, using it to accomplish his purposes and then making sure it ended at the time it needed 
to end. But he was there. The, the oppression itself, the troubles that they faced, well, they came and they went. God was constant. God was with them. In all these experiences, they could come to know his presence. Isn't that the same God we still worship? Isn't that what we experience in the oppression, the problems? You, you know, <clears throat> we don't know <clears throat> that God is present with us because our lives never have any problems. We don't know that God is present with us because no one ever attacks us or makes any problems for us. We, we don't know that God is present because nothing ever stands in the way of our plans. It's not how it is, is it? It's going to be tough sometimes. But you know what? We know that God is present because he is using those very things for the good of our heart. It's in the midst of those things that what happens? He pulls us closer to himself. He leads us so much more deeply to depend on him. So he has not abandoned his people. Rather, he wants us to know that even at such times, he is with us as we wait for the better future. He promises to his oppressed people. The truth is, the future he promises is one without any oppression at all. But as we wait for that day to come, listen to his promises and trust his plans. Amen. Please stand.